Hello plant people, how are you guys doing today? If you're new around here, my name is Ashley and I'm a soil scientist and on today's video we are going to be talking about forest fires and in particular mega fires. What exactly is going on? Is this caused by climate change? Is this normal? Kind of let's jump into the science of all this and really look at the real truth of what's happening in Canada and in a lot of cases the USA. So you guys really enjoyed the food shortage video I did not but a little while back where I explained the science behind the food shortage and exactly what's going on. Is this permanent? What are the solutions? All that fun stuff. So in today's video, we're going to be going into the science of forest fires. So to give you guys just a little bit of a background here, at the University of Saskatchewan College of Agriculture and Bioresources, which is where my degree is from, you do have to take a forest soils course. I think you actually have to take three of them, one or two of which involve field work. So you actually have to go out to the field, you live in the bush for a little bit, and you look at the soil, you look at the plants, you look at the industry, and then you also look at the ecology and reclamation of these areas. So my background is tiny in this, but I do have some background in this. So when crunching the data and looking at the facts versus the news articles, I'm able to put a little bit more perspective on exactly what's going on. Now I will warn you, the climate change people are going to be upset by this video. The anti-climate change people are going to be upset by this video video. It's just the unfortunate truth about it. I am a scientist and so science is what I live by. I have a unbiased approach to this in the sense that I am looking at papers, graphs, analytics, numbers to come to a hypothesis of what I believe may be going on. Now none of this of course is fact and it is all theory and it always will be. It will always be theory because there's no such thing as fact when we're dealing about hypotheticals such as, you know, climate change and things on such a large scale that takes place over, you know, multiple lifetimes and we've only just really recently started tracking this stuff. So let's jump into this and just get right nitty gritty into exactly what's going on. So I think it's really important to talk about the benefits of forest fires. I feel like this is usually negated or we look around these factors that make forest fires so beneficial to the ecosystem. One of the best ways to look at forest systems is from the ground up. So let's do exactly that. From a soil standpoint, uh, forest soils generally are in a sandier soil location. So if we look at a map of Canada, for example, we can see our bands of soil zones. And in these soil zones, we have relative guidelines of what the soil texture is like and once the boreal forest begins we end up with very sandy soil meaning sand soil that's unable to retain moisture and is also very difficult to retain nutrients meaning when we have a ton of biochar that is just plopped down on the soil surface through a fire we end up with higher cation exchange capacity and more micro porosity in a larger volume meaning more capillary action higher water retention higher nutrient retention and therefore obviously more fertilizer. So a healthier soil biomass is obviously a result. Another benefit that is not very often talked about but is huge is actually the regeneration of the microbiota of the soil. So if you guys did not know, in Eastern Canada things such as earthworms are non-native and they're actually doing quite a bit of damage to the ecosystems in that area, meaning there's lots of reclamation projects and things going on to try to help and remove these earthworms. For more on this topic, be sure to check out my video on earthworms and their effects on the environment. It's in the creepy crawly playlist. You can check that out there, but I won't get into that too, too, too much. However, fire is purifying in the sense that it removes weeds that are not meant to be in the area along with macro and microorganisms that can affect the soil ecosystem or the forest ecosystem in general. As we move up into the upper biomass layers of the area, forest fires are notorious for removing old growth, meaning old trees that are dead, decaying, that may harbor disease, fungus, things of that nature while also releasing seeds that are usually encapsulated in things like pine cones 
uh, in order to rejuvenate the forest floor and give light to new growth. There also is a huge benefit to the animals living in the area. So there's plenty of animals that actually move from old burn site to old burn site in hopes of living out their lives. So a great example is herding animals such as elk or in some cases hunting or animals that are predators being able to scope out the area such as wolves coyotes and then even birds of prey so hawks falcons bald eagles will reside in the single trees that are left behind build their nest in them and be able to see the ground down below for all the little critters that they may want to have a lunchtime snack from so plants animals and soil all benefit from forest fires now obviously there is issues with forest fires and some are rarely mentioned, so we will get into those right now. Obviously, smoke, uh, Saskatchewan right now is covered in a little bit of a haze. We have not only the forest fires in BC, but we also have the forest fires in northern Saskatchewan that are happening at the moment. So smoke obviously is less than ideal for elderly people, people with lung issues, and just being outside, it's not as enjoyable to be in a smoky, smoggy atmosphere. So that is a downfall. However, a benefit uh, for us right now in Saskatchewan is that without the smoke cover, our temperatures would be much, much higher at this time. And so the smoke is acting almost as a shade cloth over top of our gardens. And therefore the temperatures are seeing a little bit lower. The sun is a little bit less intense meaning our crops are less likely to burn. You're probably seeing your crops bounce back slowly. You're probably also watching the forecast in the morning, seeing it's supposed to be 35 degrees Celsius, it only ends up being 30 degrees Celsius, and that is mostly due to that smoke cover. So slight benefits, slight negatives there. But one thing that definitely is not good for the uh, when it comes to forest fires is that it removes or it harms what would be cash crops and what 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 would be used for wood and lumber and this obviously harms both the american and the canadian forestry industry so less than ideal definitely something that we need to look at and something that's actually calculated into the damage cost of a fire after it's torn through an area. It's likely we've all seen the horrific images of things like koala bears and um, deer that are harmed in the midst of a forest fire. Obviously very sad and obviously very damaging, especially if it's on a large scale. So we have animal harm and then we have human, um, human life. In you know the Lightning BC incident, two people have died. Um, people have lost their homes. That obviously is very upsetting. I could not imagine that happening. So yeah, less than ideal in that sense as well. The thing that people don't talk about is actually the putting out of the fires. So as fires start encroaching on habitats of humans, or areas of infrastructure, the government will actually bring in water bombers at as a absolute last ditch effort in order to control the fire. And generally what happens with that is we end up with a lot of erosion and displaced soil, which can actually end up in streams, rivers, and lakes. Now they try to mitigate this as much as possible, but it's not always the case. And also with the erosion, we're displacing seeds and we're actually changing in some cases the topography depending on how much water is dropped. So something that is generally not spoken about, but definitely has a large effect on the overall ecosystem as a whole. So the next question we have is how do we go about controlling these fires and what causes them? So when it comes to actual fires, we have two methods of control. The first one being logging, the second one being prescribed burns. Now, the reason or the way we choose this is actually based off the forest itself and what ecologists, environmentalists, plant scientists are telling you or telling the government about the environment or the boreal forest health. So generally people will target old growth stands for prescribed burns and for logging. So let's look at logging initially. The logging industry will pick old growth stands because these are the stands that are starting to suffer either disease or lower populations of new saplings. So as trees get larger, they begin shading out the bottom 
bottom floor more and more and a lot of seedlings need intense light and sun and heat in order to germinate so old growths or old stands will actually shade this out and we won't end up with as many seedlings at the end of the day so people will go in and they will log this these are also obviously the trees that are most valuable for the lumber industry however when we log these areas there are rules that have to be followed generally it happens in the winter to reduce soil compaction but also we will log in very irregular patterns in order to mimic those forest fires so these people will study forest fire patterns, burn patterns of forest fires, and then place them in a logging industry and map that out. So it's not uncommon in the logging industry to look at a cut block and see piles of trees kind of in the middle. You're probably thinking, why they just leave that tree there? And it's actually because it serves a purpose and that purpose is to provide homes for predatory birds, as well as the irregular patterns, the fact that it's not cut in a square, you know, animals such as elk and uh, predatory animals, they don't necessarily realize that it's man-made and they just simply think it is an area that a forest fire may have went through and so they will actually make that a home and a habitat for them. Now the issue with the logging industry is that we remove all the upper biomass, meaning what would be charcoal in the event of a forest fire has now been removed. This is very similar to what the farming industry does when we harvest our grain. We are removing that upper biomass and therefore removing all that sequestrated carbon, all that sequestrated nutrients off of the land. Meaning what's left obviously doesn't equal what was taken out. And so in some cases we will have light levels of fertilization that will happen, but all in all, it's really hard to uh, naturally replace the levels that were removed. So we also end up after all the trees were removed is a very, you know, thick leaf litter layer that is now exposed to not only the heat, but the wind and therefore it dries out and we have a tinder box in waiting that at any moment in time could, you know, burst into flames. So again, less than ideal scenario. We also obviously do not have the pur purifying results of a forest fire that changes you know, both macro and micro myvoda and then also certain seeds being released now while the forestry industry tries to do their best it doesn't always work so one really common method that the forestry industry uses for reseeding before the tree planters get into the area is taking a ship anchor chain putting it between two dozers and driving across the field ripping up and breaking open all the pine cones which in turn will help with some germination of some seedlings so to put that into perspective. Prescribed burning is a little bit different. So this is done usually in the spring or in the fall, and it is only done in springs and falls that are particularly moist, generally when snow is still on the ground and they are heavily regulated, but they are chosen the same way. So people will choose forests that are sick, both disease-wise or plant-wise, low in um, biodiversity plant-wise or animal-wise, and then choose to burn that area. However, I did find a very interesting graph when I was trying to look up the number of prescribed burns in Canada or in the US. Very hard to find that data, but I did find one graph that showed me the number of prescribed burns versus forest fires. And one thing I did note, and I'm going to go out on the limb with a theory here that there is a correlation between Canadian forestry industry like logging wood prices and prescribed burns so if our lumber industry is at an all-time high and doing very very well you will notice an absolute dive in the number of prescribed burns that are taking place conversely if there is low logging activity the prescribed burns go up makes sense right our government doesn't want to necessarily burn that very useful uh, cash heavy type resource so you'll notice a correlation in that sense and they also are selected based on very similar aspects so it would only make sense that they are in cahoots with each other for lack of a better term but obviously this doesn't serve us and our population very well when it comes to forest fires so now this begs the question between prescribed burning and the logging industry how are they not able to clean up the forest enough to prevent these mega 
fires and why are these mega fires starting to not only take or displace people out of their homes but also killing people at this point what has gone wrong that the news is just filled with these catastrophic events and the answer to this is probably not as exciting as many of you want to know it has very little to do with climate change and even less to do with the forest but everything to do with humanity <laughs> so there's a tongue twister for you and before you comment that i'm an anti-climate person climate change person whatever the case is please just give me a moment to explain myself i promise you i promise you you will see light at the end of this tunnel i'm not totally disregarding the climate change theory in late bc we saw a huge increase in temperature they actually took the cake for the record set in canada in regards to heat i think they were at a 47.6 degrees celsius which is absolutely asinine and huge however if you look at 1935 we also had a massive heat wave here in saskatchewan at 45.3 degrees celsius which was the world or the canadian record for you know nearly a hundred years so to put that into perspective obviously heat waves are a very a very natural cyclical weather phenomenon that we see in all over the world so you can't just say a heat wave is a cause of climate change however climate change obviously the theory or the narrative that they're going to push more and more is that it's not just the single heat wave that is causing the issue it is the fact that the overall temperatures are going and increasing over time and i don't think anyone can really deny that the temperature are increasing and maybe in some cases the water levels are going down or the water levels are going up now can you chalk this up to co2 and human intervention maybe but you can also maybe chalk it up to again this very cyclical nature of the world i mean there is currently cities that used to be cities under the ocean to put into perspective how dry the the entire world used to be at some point the oceans were you know or kilometers receded from the shorelines of what they are now so I don't think we have enough data to for sure say you know 100 that this is climate change but heat is a factor now i know the latent bc you know it came out that it was most likely man-made but high temperatures and any human activity it's not a good thing it does not equal goodness so let's get into why humans and towns are going up to flames and we never heard of this before and this has a lot to do with where we're putting our cities our homes our cabins our lakes our infrastructure so as we become more and more wealthy here in first world countries we want to acquire more and more stuff such as cabins and lake houses and things like that there's nothing wrong with that but what ends up happening is when we place cabins or when we buy a trailer and we go to the lake we want to see trees we want to see the boreal forest and therefore we would be very upset if we went to the lake and the government decided to clear cut or log or prescribe burn what would have been our campsite so clearly that's a problem and therefore because of that and because of tourism and the money that that whole world brings in we generally tend to pull back on logging we tend to pull back on prescribed burning my dog is digging in my garden thank god there's nothing planted there right now anyways um we we tend to pull back on the all these things which in turn ends up with aged foliage aged trees in the environment of cabins towns cities places that are in the bush when we end up with old trees old growth old stands in what would be a town or a city when lightning does strike when a firework gets out of control when a cigarette butt is thrown out the window it tends to go up in flames and with it it can take out an entire uh, city or town in some cases now this isn't new this whole concept of not living in the forest or if we live in the forest we need to burn it actually we could take a lot from the first nations that lived in north america long before we did and they did this 
ritualistically. They didn't call them prescribed burns, they called them cultural burns. And it is a very known fact that this is what they did because they are trying to pull down or pass down their tradition to us now. So I think if we worked more closely with First Nations groups, we probably would get a little bit of insight. Now, I don't want to put words into the First Nations groups' mouths, but there is a group in BAC that calls it the lightning of the load on the land. And with this, we do something called a cultural burn, and it is something that they've done for hundreds of years. They would live in areas of the forest, the, the rainforest in BC or the boreal forest in Saskatchewan here. And over time, they would notice a decrease in the biodiversity of both the plants and the animals. That is when the First Nations knew that that stand was getting old and they did a low-key version of reclamation to the area and so they would do a cultural burn which is identical to a prescribed burn it was controlled it was done respectfully and they would let the whole area go up in flames and then they would move their homes to a new position when they moved their homes to the new position they knew in 50 100 years when their kids their grandkids went into that area in order to live that it would be biodiverse again it would have berries it would have much more plant resources and things of that nature we don't do that anymore we are stuck in homes and therefore when the forests around us get old rather than burning them we try to you know put them on life support for as long as possible unfortunately it doesn't always happen um, and we end up with cases like you know Fort Mac light in BC and, and it's an unfortunate uh, truth, but a reality of living in a forest or in a boreal forest system. Now, in a grassland, uh, fires, First Nations people used to talk about rolling fires that would go 365 days a year and they would just go up and down the Great Plains. We don't have that anymore. We don't have grass fires anymore here in North America because we've decimated the Great Plains. They simply just don't exist in large swaths anymore. We've gotten rid of it. It's all farmland. And therefore we don't have a lot of dead foliage on the land. And we basically have you know, logging, for lack of a better term, happening repeatedly every year for the entire length of the Great Plains. So we don't end up with the same effects. But if we were in a grassland environment, we were you know, in our sod huts, or um, we were First Nations people living a nomadic life in teepees, similar thing would happen. Um, we would end up with fires. It's just a fact of nature. It is just what happens. Well, I don't feel like I can make the claim that we have old growth forests that you know last for ages and we do nothing with them and that's why it's swallowing towns and communities without backing it up with a real world example. And so a real world example for me would be the PA forest. This is north of PA between PA and La Ronge, and this is lake country. You drive up that highway and it is lake after lake after lake after lake all you know provincial parks national parks Waska Sioux one of my favorite places in the entire world is in that area now I'd say for probably the last 10 years anyone who drove up that way or drives to that forest you don't have to know much about forestry you don't have to know much about plants or soil in order to recognize that that forest is very very sick and that forest is very very sick because it's very very old and so with that forest we had in you know the 80s I believe uh, a beetle infestation go through the area and beetles insects actually are also just as purifying as forest fires and logging in some cases and so we had you know a beetle infestation go through and the cabin owners in the Waska Sioux area were upset by this because it was ruining the value of their cabins it was ruining the aesthetic of the lake and therefore the government stepped in for you know the sake of saving tourism and actually sprayed out all the invasive insects or the not even invasive their native insects is very natural normal thing to happen but we got rid of them and so over time we just kept on tacking everything that was trying to purify and we tried to control the environment in hopes of ramping up tourism and so now we have a very sick forest and a really great example of how sick this forest is is if you're driving up that highway or in Saskatchewan keep your eyes out for you know clumps of leaves or brown branches on a tree so very very popular just outside PA once you get over the bridge on the northern side you'll notice you know these big spruce trees or these big jack pines that have clumps of pine needles or branches on one side and this is actually caused by a fungus called mistletoe 
And the irony to this is that mistletoe is only removed via fire. And the Canadian or the Saskatchewan government has repeatedly put out any forest fires going through the area because it's getting too close to infrastructure and too close to homes. I mean, it makes sense. Human life, it's important. And so with that, when we put those fires out, we, you know, we lose the benefits of the fire in cleansing out things such as mistletoe. So it was about five years ago that the government realized, you know, we got to do something about this forest. Tourism is wonderful, but there's not going to be any if we don't do something. And so they began logging. So if you watch when you're driving down the highway, if you stop on the highway and you actually look through the trees, there's about 20 feet of forest and then it's a big open field behind that. <laughs> and that is because it has been logged and it's been logged for good reason because it is firewood waiting to go up in flames. And so they've logged a lot of those areas. And in some cases, the effects of the mistletoe, the effects of the disease and the aging forest in and of itself is so bad that logging is just simply not an option. And so they have begun to prescribe to burn. And actually when I was up there this spring in Waskasu, we were doing some hikes. I think we were doing some ice fishing and they were prescribed burning. They had big signs that said prescribed burn in process and they were going through and they were burning the forest. And again, for good reason, it's an old forest. It is very sick. And if we don't do something, you know, we're, there's not, there's it, nothing's going to be left. So it's better to do things in patches and do it in a controlled, respectful manner. So again, in order to back up my claim that I don't think this is climate change and I don't think that this is anything out of the ordinary, I think it's just the news uh, over amplifying a situation is because when we look at historical data, it speaks volumes to what's going on. And so when I initially was going to start this video, I do quite a bit of research for my videos. I don't just jump on camera and talk to you guys about what I think or what I feel. Um, I literally dive into journals. I dive into data. I dive into historical reports on things. And when you listen to the news, you hear mega fire, you hear big fire. And so you get worried and you think, okay, yeah, these fires have to be big. Like if the news is saying these are some of the, the biggest fires ever, like this is terrifying. Like what's going on? But I was absolutely dumbfounded when I found out that the fires we have today are nothing compared to what was here before us. Unbelievable what was going on prior to prescribed burning and logging and you know human intervention so let's jump into exactly what i'm talking about well, the records start around 1825 now the first nations groups will tell you that prior to this there was major forest fires prior to this there was major grassland fires and it was just a normal life a day in the life of being in north america so um, unfortunately we can't go back too too far but 1825 is kind of like the big bad boy that we do know and we can kind of conceptualize a little bit. 1825 there was a major fire in the New Brunswick area and now you have to keep in mind that the dollar value associated with this fire is much much lower than the dollar value associated with fires today. So if we look at the reports that are probably going to come out in the next six months about the forest fires currently happening you're going to see these big inflated prices and that's actually because they don't just take into consideration the loss of infrastructure both government roads um, housing you know human displacement but they also take into consideration the cash crop the actual wood that would be harvested for building things and so these older fires don't have that dollar value associated with them because they don't have a dollar value associated with the lumber they don't take that into consideration but with lumber prices the way they are right now i'm expecting some pretty big numbers that are going to be very glorified and much larger than what they were even last year so 1825 New Brunswick, there was a major fire that swallowed 3 million acres. And apparently this fire went on for like weeks, like two weeks. And it happened after a very hot, very dry, scary dry season. It didn't take place until October. To put that in perspective, it was dry spring, all the way to October. And so it was 3 million acres 
unbelievable volume of land. I don't think you guys realize how big that is. It was caused by hot weather. So that, that's, that's caused by climate. Um, 1845, there was, you know, some scattered in between there. 1845 was the next big bad boy in North America. And that was at 1.5 million acres. It was called the Great North Fire. It was in Idaho, Western Montana, Tana, and extensions into East Washington and Southeast British Columbia. So again, very dry year. It was a drought year that year. It comes in 10 year cycles, I guess, or 20 year cycles, I guess. And so um, that really hot season, it was, you know, they think it was a spark. It could have been from anything near uh, hypothesizing things like trains, um, just like camps, anything of any nature is 1845. So I, I mean, it's not like there was industrial things going on but something caused the fire it was very dry and therefore the entire forest went up into absolute flames it went through all the way through the u.s up into canada so again very huge very big no major dollar value associated with it and again that is because it's very hard to calculate that based on the time frame that this happened. Again, we have a whole bunch of fires scattered in between, and then we have 1871, where we have the Peshtigo fire, which is 1.2 million acres, and that was in Wisconsin and Michigan, and this one uh, people had passed away in. There was obviously infrastructure damage. It was 1.2 million acres, so again, very, very large. And the ones in between this were, you know, 500,000, 250,000, 750,000, like, there were very, very high volumes of acreage. And I mean, in today's world would be catastrophic. And so when a 3 million acres burns or 1.5 million acres or 1.2 million acres burns, that smoke is going to travel distances. I mean, I wouldn't doubt it if that 3 million acre um, forest fire didn't almost cause a cooling effect all across North America, depending on which direction the wind, winds were going in, I wouldn't be surprised if it had an early winter because of that, because that's just absolutely insanity. So I read that and I right away thought, okay, so the ones for 2020, they're going to be huge. They're going to be, you know, 4 million acres. Like they're calling these things mega fires. And you never hear about Pashtigo fire. Like I've never heard of that before. So I was immediately assuming that the, the ones that were last year were going to be huge, massive. The biggest one last year was the Bighorn fire and it was 120,000 acres, 120,000. That's it. That actually is smaller than the smallest forest fire in basically all the 1900s. Like, it was like a fraction of all the ones that happened in, in the 1900s. So does that mean we're doing a good job of logging? Does that mean we're doing a good job of prescription burning? I don't know. But the concern here is that you have more people dying, you have more infrastructure that's being damaged, and I don't know if it, that's because our population is becoming so vast, or if it's because we're moving into areas that maybe we shouldn't have put homes in, or if we're not maintaining the forest around those homes, or if it's a combination of all those things in conjunction with, you know, a very obviously climbing temperature, outdoors, you know, lack of rain, you know, drought, I don't know. I don't have the answer to that, but the dollar value is getting bigger and the death toll is rising despite these drastically smaller fires. I mean, the biggest one in 2020 was, I don't one thirtieth of the biggest one in eight. I, I just, I don't know that I, I, when I found this out, I literally texted everyone I knew the data and I was like, is this, is this right? Like, am I reading this? And then I actually ended up finding a uh, CBC article that said the Pachitigo fire was one of the biggest fires ever and uh, how no one had ever heard about it. So they did mention it in passing, but oh my gosh, my dog did mention it uh, in passing, but they never want to allude to it when they're talking about mega fires. Now they just call them mega fires, but there's nothing really to back up the mega fire claim because really, it's not a mega fire compared to what we used to have to go through 
uh, in North America. And again, like First Nations people are saying, because Chico fire was small beans compared to what we've seen before. So, I mean, and they would know because they've been here for longer. So, I mean, I, I would be so terrified if that would come through my area. Knowing what I know about forest fires and how they actually can create their own tornadoes and stuff like that, like, yes, that's no thanks. No thanks. Thank God for prescribed burning and logging. It would not be good what it came. Anyways, I want to thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, if you made it to the end, you officially have the full picture. You didn't just, you know, react, which is always a good thing. Uh, if you enjoyed it, be sure to give it a thumbs up. Hit the subscribe button. And of course, always let me know your theories on what you think may be going on. I respect if you think it's climate change. I respect if you think it's not climate change. Just try to keep the name calling and stuff to a minimum and always, you know, back it up with facts. It is a science channel. So, you know, come in with some facts. There's facts for both sides of the argument. I don't know which one's right. I don't know which one's wrong. I think they all have their merits. I will talk to you guys next time. Bye.